And we will open up our copy of the scriptures to Acts chapter 5. We'll read verses 4, 24 through 42. Acts 5, 24. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. <coughs> but Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you have put to death by hanging on him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and were intending to slay them. But a certain Pharisee named Gam Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, proclaiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. And he was slain, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. And so, in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if, if this plan or action should be of man, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. And they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them to speak no more in the name of Jesus, and then release them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, the word of the Lord. title of the sermon this morning, Hypocrites Opposing God's Will and Work. You know, Jesus spoke about the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the high priests. He called them hypocrites. In Matthew 23, he goes to great length to describe the hypocrisy. The Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the uh, now, righteousness should exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because theirs was merely outward, not inward. Theirs was, as Matthew 6 would describe, to be seen of other people, to be noticed, to have the praises from other humans rather than the praises from God. <clears throat> so when you think then of these people, you must come to the conclusion here we have once again, the council that is uh, 
ungodly in every way. <clears throat> and here, or almost every way, and here we find, there are exceptions in the Council of Court, but here we find that uh, some of these things come to the surface. And there are lessons to learn from. You know, uh, you have disciples or apostles that are Christ's own, their heart and life belongs to him, and it's obvious. Everything there is unto and for him. On the other hand, you have those that are on the council that are there for pride's sake, pride, position, and power. Actors, self-serving, just the opposite of the apostles that they are judging. When Jesus spoke of these, and we find it over mentioned, you have it in your bulletin insert, where in the sermon helps, not insert, but in the sermon helps, or sermon notes, it says they are taken out of the epistles of Paul and Timothy. It says they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And so when we think here of what we find, we find uh, this new covenant era in Christ's uh, kingdom and church expanding from Jerusalem, and here still in Jerusalem. <clears throat> but I want to back up to verses 12 and following to get the flow of what's taking place. And let me begin, first of all, with the signs of the kingdom of Christ and deliverance. The signs of the kingdom of Christ and deliverance. So, beginning in verse 12, let me read 12 to 16 for you, if I may. It says, And through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, for the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits or demons. And they were all healed. <clears throat> what are the Lord? The signs of the kingdom. Signs of deliverance. Well, first of all, in verse 12, as we, I see it, it's the king's spirit and power at work. He's working through his ambassadors. Remember, these, it says, through the apostles. We recall that in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about, we are, are we, speaking of apostles, are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, an ambassador is a representative of that, that kingdom, of that uh, whole governmental structure, and so representing that totality. These apostles, each of them, were exactly that. In Matthew chapter 10, remember Jesus is about to send his apostles or disciples out, and he says, those who receive you, receive me. And those who reject you, reject me. And so these men here functioning as ambassadors of this kingdom of grace in Christ. Furthermore, in verses 12 uh, through 16, you see here physical signs of spiritual deliverance. Physical signs of spiritual deliverance. Remember when we went through the miracles of Christ? Remember we looked through of, of how Christ, you know, when he healed the blind, he caused the blind men to see. And we talked about how that's a physical wonder to be true. It is something that is glorious, especially for the one who cannot see. But it represented or was a sign of something far deeper. And by the way, eternal. And that is God by his spirit taking the blinders off of us so that the God of this age has blinded our minds. Now we may see the glory of God in the face of Christ. We are who are at one time in darkness dwell in unapproachable light of God by his spirit. How about those who, are, who died like Lazarus? Lazarus dead in the tomb. When Jesus Christ brought him forth from the tomb, he called him by name, Lazarus, come forth. He came forth. Remember what we said. We recall Acts, or excuse me, Ephesians 2 or Colossians 3 or other places where it says 
that you and I, spiritually speaking, start out spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. Total inability, total depravity. And it's God by his grace and power who calls us from death unto life and raises us from the dead by his spirit. We are died with Christ, but we're also raised in Jesus Christ to walk in the midst of life. So when you look at this entire thing together, you see, all they were doing, they were showing forth what this reality of this kingdom of kingdom rescue of the Lord is really all about. These apostles in Hebrews 2, it describes in 3 and 4, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So God bore witness that these things are so. The sign is given at the very beginning to confirm it as it's in its pioneer stages. So, the physical signs of spiritual deliverance. But there's more. You notice here that it says that they were increasingly uh, uh, added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. That makes the point of saying, not just men this time, but of saying men and women. And so multitudes were added. How is that happening? How is it through the disciples, the apostles? as they preach Christ, teaching Christ, preaching Christ. Well, it's nothing less than the shepherd himself, the shepherd himself calling through these men, gathering his sheep, these multitudes. It's Christ, the good shepherd, by the Spirit, calling these multitudes unto himself, bringing them alive. In John 6, verse 37, Jesus said, All those the Father has given unto me, will come unto me. And those who come unto me, I will by no means cast out. Chapter 10 of the same gospel of John. You know, what is it? In verse uh, 27 or so. There the Lord says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I've told you before about my friend um, in the Congo. He was not a Christian even. He was a, a Frenchman that I was witnessing to. I wish I could say he was gloriously converted, but he wasn't that I know of. But he was a shepherd. He went there with UNESCO to teach people how to raise sheep, not the Congolese, how to raise sheep. And I went with him, and I won't belabor the point, but he, he had these flocks in these various fields, and he would walk along this spine, you know, of a high ground there. And he would, as he would whistle and call, all of these flocks start trailing up to that the ridge, you know, that spine of of, uh, of the high ground and here they would all follow him behind and they would just follow him to, to this big pasture they would lead them to the big Chadian rams you know going to the big like big horn sheep you know, kind of like that they would come over to him and they would lean on him you know, like you, know, you have a big old dog that kind of leans on him they would do that they loved the shepherd Jesus says I am the good shepherd he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Why were multitudes coming unto the apostle? It wasn't the dynamism of the apostles. It wasn't their personality, the strength of their personality, or the way they looked or anything of that nature. It was the power and the will of Jesus Christ by his spirit, speaking through them and calling them to him. He was the one. When they were coming. They were merely under shepherds, I think. And so here's what the Lord's doing. And if you look there in verse 16 at the beginning, it says they were drawn to Jerusalem, to the apostles. Remember, it was there in Jerusalem, and it said all the outlying towns, cities, people coming from Jericho, coming from Bethlehem, coming from Beersheba, coming from all over, they were coming to Jerusalem. Remember what Jesus said: You shall be my witnesses. First in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so just as the Lord promised, rivers of salvation shall flow from his holy hill. And 
Finally, at the end of verse 16, you notice those who had unclean spirits. In other words, those who were slaves to sin and to Satan were set free. They have a new Lord. No longer in darkness, but life and light. Remember Matthew 12, 28 to 30, you read it there. And Jesus talks about, if I cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. He says, how can, you, how can I do this except I first bind the strong man and then plunder his house? The one who is with, you're either with me or you're against me. It's one way or the other. In this picture of Acts chapter 5, we see those two contrasts, those two extremes. With him or against him. Think of what he says. In Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. You can follow along if you want. I'm going to read it quickly. But in Luke 10, Jesus sent out the 70. This is before his crucifixion and ascension. But a picture of what he was doing. He sends these men out in, in the power of his name. 70 witnesses, like the 70 elders in the wilderness. 70 witnesses he sends to the, the people of Israel throughout the land. And he enables them to, to do these signs and to preach the kingdom of heaven has come. And as they come back to him in verse 17, the 70 returned with him with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Now listen to the next part. In your name. Remember the Sanhedrin says, no more do you preach in this name. You see, but here the Lord is subject in his name. Verse 18, he said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. The victory, the deliverance that Jesus brings. That's what he's doing. He's setting the people free by the gospel and the power of the spirit of the kingdom. He's setting people free from the domination of sin and darkness and death in their lives setting them free in him. So in verse 19, he says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's what we're seeing in the book of Acts being played out in these apostles. The signs of the kingdom of Christ, the signs of his deliverance. But my second point here, verses 17 to 28. The rebels rise up to reject and repel the king's rule. Some of you are taking notes, so I'll go through it again. That, that point turned out to be like a Puritan point, you know, kind of like half a paragraph or something. Let me try it again. The rebels rise up to reject and repel. The king's rule. Verses 17 to 28. Here in verse 17, we notice, then, now all that wonderful thing, I, wonderful things I just described, you read to you, in verse 17, what's the reaction of the leadership of the people of God, of Israel? Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. That's the reaction. The demonstration of what Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. Well, four times in this text you see a man mentioned prominently, the high priest. The high priest and those who are with him especially those of the Sadducees. They were the ones who were very much uh, politically connected. They were the ones who the high priest appointed by Pilate. They were the ones who were concerned most about uh, things that would, uh, that would please uh, the secular government. And so here, as we look at this, the opposition, they were indignant. They were indignant because of the activity of the saints of the Lord. 
They're indignant because of the blessing of the Holy Spirit. They're indignant because of the life and deliverance God's brought. That causes you to scratch your head, doesn't it? But you see, if they don't believe that's real, they don't believe or understand the spiritual realities, and they don't trust in the things of the Bible, of course they'd be indignant because they would see it as a challenge to their authority, which is the only one that mattered to them. Moreover, as you look at verse 18, what do they do? But they intervene to stop them. They must bring this to a halt. This gathering of, of crowds that are in one accord in the Lord. They have to stop it. The Lord's glory, the Lord's authority. Notice what they do. First of all, they want to stop the Lord's work. Secondly, what do they want to do? Punish the Lord's ministers. And finally, they want to scatter the followers. That's their goal. Now let me give you an insight at this point, just for a moment. There's a strategy of the Lord. And as I mentioned in last, the Lord brings them all together to Jerusalem from all of these outlying countries, all these different languages, and he brings them to one central place at the Feast of Pentecost. Conversion occurs, teaching and fellowship and the Lord's Supper and all of these things, building them up, preparing them for what? Well, they have a mega church in Jerusalem, of course. No. No. And so the Lord will continue to show them. And then he'll show them the cost of discipleship, as he sees here. And he'll strengthen the, the apostles in, in his grace. And he'll have them pour themselves into these men. And he'll show them signs to confirm this is truly of our Lord in heaven. Our Lord is at the right hand of the Father. He was crucified. But we're witnesses, he's truly risen from the dead. And he's the one doing this by his Holy Spirit. And as these people are equipped, and as all of this occurs, we'll see by the time we get to chapter 7, this persecution boils up. You see, first of all, in chapter 4, they were warned. Now in chapter 5, they'll be punished. And then in chapter 7, one will be killed. And then in chapter 8, the persecution with a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus will begin in earnest and hunting them down, arresting them, even killing them, the church. So what happens? Well, they've been busted up and scattered. It's all over. No. As they go, the Lord's brought them there. What does he do? They go back. And as they go, they're scattered by persecution all over, out of Jerusalem. Okay, your time of formation is done. Now you go out of Jerusalem and you take that gospel with you to these nations you came from. You came from Cyprus, you returned to Cyprus, but this time with the gospel. You've been formed, you've been prepared. Now you go and sow the seeds of the kingdom where you go. You see the strategy of God? The enemy thinks we've got him on the run. God says, no, no. I'm the one who put it in your heart to use this for my glory. It's extraordinary. So that's what we see being played out right before our eyes here in this text. So the Lord's glory, his authority. <clears throat> They're jailed. Oh no, now. Now more glory. Look what happens. You see that they're they're imprisoned. And then verses 19 and 20, what does the Lord do? Now, by the way, you'll notice it's all the apostles here. Remember before chapter 4, which is Peter and John. This time it's all the apostles. All of the apostles are arrested. So we don't know if it's 11 or if they've got Matthias too, the, who is a temporary 12th. Whatever the case, they've got them all. They've got them all in the jail. They put them all there. Now they, they're going to bring this to an end really quickly. What happens? You see what it says here. The Lord sends his angel. The angel of the Lord opens the cell. Come on, let's get out of here. He leads them out of the cell. And what does he say to do, though? Look at verse 20 with me. As you read here in verse 20, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. In other words, this gospel of life of Jesus Christ. So he didn't say, I'm going to get you out of a tight spot so you can run in line. Yeah. <clears throat> Just the contrary. 
The angel of the Lord, remember what angel means, whether it's Old Testament malach or it is New Testament word angelos, it means someone who is a messenger of the Lord, a servant of the Lord. And so he brought the message of the Lord. What does the Lord want them to do? Here's the will of God. Here's what the Lord wants you to do. They arrested you there, and they're in the temple, and they're going to hold court in the temple. What do you do? Go to the temple and teach. Right into the teeth of the dragon is where the Lord sends them. Now, are they obedient? Do they do what they're told? Let's read on. In verse 21, when they heard, it says that go stand in the temple. So verse 21, they heard that. They entered the temple early in the morning and taught. So they didn't even procrastinate. You know, early in the morning, I want to be their first thing. And so here they are, all the apostles, once again, in the temple, teaching the people of God. Wow. Now the high priest and those with him called the council together, all the elders of the children of Israel, and were sent to they sent to the prison to have them brought out. This is comical in a way. You've got all these, these disciples or apostles are out there in the temple teaching and preaching to the people. And here's the council in another room, you know, off in another room off of the, that part, in another wing of the temple. And they're holding court. Well, I don't know, we, we're, we're ready now. We'll listen to them. Here their case, you know. And where are they? Well, you send them to jail. Bring them in here, you know. Leave them in chains. That'll show them. They're out there preaching and teaching in the temple. And so they go sin. And you see in verses 22 and 3, they send the guards, or send the, the temple uh, police to go down there to re retrieve the prisoners. They find the doors locked and they find the guards alert and at their posts. But they find no apostles in the jail. So they're a little embarrassed. And they wonder, you see there in the next verse, it says they're wondering what to make of these things, what, what's going to happen about them. And so that's a, where we find ourselves. And now look at verse uh, 25. And so one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. So here, you see, God is showing us a lesson here that here before all to see, with all to hear, all to see, the message of God goes forth, and it is the power of God's word that matters. It is the importance of the message the ambassador has been given to deliver that matters more than anything else. And to declare it in enemy territory, that's not enemy territory. Not really. Oh, we got enemies in it. But remember, the temple is the house of the Lord. The temple is where the Lord says, this is my house, a house of prayer, I put it should be. And so there in the midst of that, where better should they be proclaiming the, the things of Christ and the kingdom of heaven? And there we find them doing just that. Well, the captain, in verse 26, went with the officers, and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, and they would be stoned. So they brought them without violence because of self-interest, not because they were merciful. There's the idea. So in other words, it was pragmatism, not grace, that caused them to bring these men that way. Think of all the people that were around. Remember, they were preaching everywhere they preached and talked. There were multitudes. And it wasn't just one apostle. There were all 11 or 12 that were there. You count my five. And they're preaching and teaching each one. To who knows how many people. You got this crowd of people, a multitude of people. And they were afraid they'd be stoned. Beloved, we should never underestimate what God is able to do. And so when we look at these, we see they are the ones who are afraid. But what do they seek to do? Let me hasten to verses 26 through 28. They bring them before the court. You see, they want to have court. They want to be sure that they're, they're lofty and above them. They want to be sure they have the 
power that intimidates these men. So they want to intimidate these apostles with their position, intimidate with their authority. That's the idea. And so, what is the question? Let me look at verses 27 and 8. They brought them before them, and the high priest again asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Wouldn't you love to be accused of that? You filled Gig Harbor with your doctrine. There's an accusation that'd be great, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? And so you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. I got news for him. It's already on you. Right? You intend to bring this man's blood on us. Let's look, first of all, at the hypocrisy that's involved. The opposition, the self-righteous people that are the crooks are the ones who are indignant, not the ones who have been manhandled and arrested before the crowd. Furthermore, notice as this marvelous work of God is taking place, it's obvious it's a work of God. Not a one of those men on the Sanhedrin could heal a single person. Not a one of those men on the Sanhedrin could cast out one of those demons. And here, God's power, obviously at work in all that's taking place, and not just one or two isolated cases, nothing being faked, but all of it supernatural, from on high, the Spirit of God. Obviously, Jesus is risen. Obviously, He's innocent because it's his spirit and his power causing it to be so. So instead of that thought even being allowed to be entertained, instead, what do they have? Critical, condemning hearts. Beloved, if there's anything that's common to hypocrisy, it is a critical, <coughs> condemning heart of everyone else, but not oneself. So these claims and this evidence should be clearly seen in their minds and hearts. Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. He's the only one that's a true head of the church. Now, by the way, as I speak here about hypocrisy and these people, it's easy for me to say, see, obviously hypocrites. <clears throat> and I talked about it. The judgmental, critical spirit. Beloved, here's a lesson I've learned about hypocrisy. It's something I must always be mindful of, as well as all we all should be. Let us consider ourselves most of all, instead of having the finger always pointing to others around us. Let's desire to flee all forms of hypocrisy, rather than focusing on that in those around us. So as I look at these folks, look at verse 28 again. Did we not strictly command you? Now get what's going on. We commanded you not to teach in this name. Now in the authority of this name, demons are being cast out. In the authority of this name, Jesus Christ, his authority, his person, his work, in this authority, by this name, people are being delivered throughout all of Judea, obviously. And the word had come to them, it had to have come to them because it made them angry. They were indignant. Some translations will even say jealous. It can go either way in the translation of that word. But you see, what they're getting at we commanded you not to in this name. In other words, man's authority is higher than that of Jesus Christ. What do you think? I think it's obvious that we're all known. And so, the condemning judicial thought of this court is, you seek to bring this man's blood on us. Well, let's review the facts. 
Notice, by the way, they're not accepting any responsibility for the crucifixion of Christ, apparently. Nothing wrong. We did absolutely nothing. Have you ever known anyone that self-righteous that they thought they didn't do anything wrong? I'm so filled with self-doubt. I'm always wondering, did I, I'm always questioning myself. Did I do that right? What did I do wrong? I know I did something wrong here. I can't be perfectly right in this. I mean, we should have some self-doubt, shouldn't we? Confidence is fine. Pride is not. Self-righteousness is not. It's a sin. And that's where they are. Accepting no responsibility. Let me just remind you about a couple of things. John chapter 10, verses 48 to 49. Jesus had healed Lazarus. Many of you remember that. They pretend that it's God's truth and God's service and God's honor that's paramount in their thinking. That's what they're pretending. It's because we're defending God's honor, God's glory here. That's why we're doing this, right? That must be the pretense that's going on. It's really personal self-interests. That's really what they're serving. Let me read you out of John 11, verses 48 and 49. And there it says, after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, it says this, if we lay them alone, let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Okay. Well, if he's a Messiah, then good. Read the next line. Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, same high priest this year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider. It's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation perish. If you back up to verse 47, it says, The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered counsel and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? This guy's doing many wonders, many miracles. We have to stop it. What? You see what's going on here? That's darkness of heart and mind. Well, is there responsibility bringing his blood on us? Well, they're personally offended. How can he bring his blood on, on us? How do they bring the blood of this man on us? They impugn us, the truth tellers, the judges. But actually, they intended to, to kill him. Let me just remind you what it says over in Matthew 27. Read 1 and 20 and 25. That would get you started. In Matthew 27, there it is, says it was the high priest who encouraged the people to ask for Jesus to be killed, crucified. Verse 20, it goes on with the same thing, egging the people on. And what did they, what did they egg the people on to say? It's recorded in, in John 19. You know, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Oh, tragedy. So by the time you get to Matthew 27, 25, you talk about blood on us. You get what they said there? Let his blood be on us and on our children. So great work. So as this council, this high priest and this council say they attempt to bring this man's blood upon us, it was already there. You see, beloved, the depth of denial can be profound indeed. They were blind in denial. They were hardened against the obvious hand of the Lord the Lord Christ in his chair. And so the crime, the evil, the torture, the murder of one who was obviously the Holy Messiah, certainly by now we should see it. There was no repentance, there was no self-doubt, there was no concern 
There was only self-righteousness that ignored the facts. And self-preservation was the result. Oh, beloved. That's hypocrites. Opposing God's will and God's work. It's a saddening thing, isn't it? Well, we're going to have a part two, obviously. We'll actually come and develop the part we read in the first reading. But oh, we have to get all of it. And you see, beloved, as we study this <clears throat> together, there are many lessons for us to take home with us. These were men who delighted in all the particulars of religion. They loved the recognition. You know, I remember what the Bible, or what people have said many times about Christianity. They said, you know, really, you know the truth of one's Christianity when you know what they're like when no one's looking. And uh, these folks, even when you're looking, they were so hardened in this hypocrisy. It had taken over so much that they were to the point of calling evil good and good evil. And they were judging him, the judge. Why we love this? As we look at verses 29 to 42 next time. Let's bear in mind as we study it together. We see God's work in the midst of the darkest of situations. This looks like a horrible situation. But I have to read at least one other verse beyond where we left off. Maybe two. Is that all right? We'll come back to it. But look what it says. Of course, you know, this occurred, you, we strictly commanded you. Verses 29, well, just 29 for a minute. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, that's a very straightforward and simple answer. But sometimes you don't need to come. Sometimes it's just that simple. We ought to obey God rather than man. If we can remember that simple principle and take it with us, wherever we go, whatever we do, beloved, it is so clarifying. We don't misuse it. We must not. But you see here, when it comes down to the straightforward Confrontation. Remember what it is. You know that that part where where some authority over us would require what God uh, God would would say we should not have. He forbids. So if they require what God forbids, or to turn it around, if they forbid what God requires, it is better to obey God. In fact, we must obey God, not man. That's where these men found themselves. By the way, at the end of the story, they were beaten for it. Oh, here I am faithful to you, Lord, and you still let me suffer. Well, that's not exactly the way they looked at it. That's not the way the Bible presents it. You see, we need to come to grips with the mindset, the faith, the sense of priority, the sense of selflessness that we see evident here in the pages of Holy Writ. And so as we study through the book of Acts, that's what we should keep our eyes open for. That God may form this power and life in us. Oh, how Christ will be magnified that way. May God grant us a grace.